Come on, guys, this is worth getting excited about. Because some of us have lived the gospel like it's kind of good news. And it's actually really good news. And we've lived Christianity going this entry room. I mean, it's cool, it's good, God. I love taking my shoes off. And he goes, no, 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 I didn't die. So you join a club. Guilt, out of guilt, read your Bible. Out of guilt, have a little prayer life and struggle with sin your whole life. He goes, I didn't go to a cross for that. I didn't cross so you'd be, a, I didn't go to the cross so you'd be a little bit better of your previous version. I didn't go to the cross so you'd have 30 days of this and 10 weeks to that and 40 years to this. He goes, I, don't, I didn't go to the cross for any of that. He goes, I went to a cross because the moment you believe in me, you're a new creation. The moment you believe in me, you are a new creation. The moment that you step into my presence, I am with you. And from that moment into eternity, you will ride this chariot of the gospel into eternity. He says, nothing will separate you from my love. No hardship, no trouble, no difficulty, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. One more on this greatness of the gospel. Uh, Banning referenced this a bit, and I want to read you this passage, Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. Paul has this revelation of the gospel himself. He goes, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. And this is what he says, those things I've lost, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. What he's saying here, he goes, all these things, and Paul had a lot more than probably any of us in the room. Education, credentials, family background, tribe of Israel, mentors pouring into his life, academic understanding, the guy is the cream of the crop in his society. And he looks at all of that pedigree. He looks at all of that resume. And then he looks over here and he goes, the gospel? Worship a God I cannot see. Follow a voice I cannot hear. Believe for an eternity I cannot see. But by faith, this is real. And by faith, This is garbage. (laughs) And he goes, just so you know, like Banning said, when I said yes to Jesus, I didn't give anything up. Sacrifice as we have defined it does not exist in the kingdom. Because sacrifice would insinuate that I've given up something better than what I gained. Or it's not a sacrifice. And Paul goes, let it be clear, for all of eternity, I have not given up anything in comparison to what I have gained. And I count all of this garbage. It's like that bargaining that that Banning talked about, that God doesn't bargain with us. But if there was a conversation about the gospel, and if I were Paul in this storyline, it'd be like coming up to God and God goes, hey, the gospel's this good, it's this real. It's life's not, it's not, doesn't mean life's gonna be easy, but the gospel is the power to overcome. The gospel is the power to persevere. The, The gospel is the power to find life in the midst of the difficulty. He goes, this is the good news. I will forgive you, I will wash you in the blood of my son, We will live in all of eternity with me. You will inherit an eternal kingdom. He goes, this is what I will give you. And this whole thing's worth, let's just say, $100 billion. He goes, that's what I've given you. This is how amazing this gift is. And he goes, here's all I'm going to need from you. But I want you to pray about it. I want you to go home and fast because it's a big decision. Give me $100 billion to be a co-inheritor of my eternal kingdom. So don't make this decision hastily, but I'm going to need you to give a dollar. And we're like, dang. Walk away from the table. i got to call my wife. We need to pray. We need to fast, babe. God's asking too much. And he's given too little. This kingdom thing, I don't know. Pray, fast, three days, walk back to the table. How many Christians are holding on to their dollar? When he goes, do you know how good the gospel really is? And we're hanging on to our dollar going, God's, like Banning said, he goes, no, 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 I need it all. I need everything. I need everything. But in reality, our everything is a dollar compared 
to what Jesus has already done. And Paul goes, just so you're aware, everything I gave for the greatness of this gospel was rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. What I have found in knowing him is nothing compared to what I gave up in my previous way of life. This is the greatness of the gospel. One more thing on this, and then you're going to share with each other, is I love Paul. You know, he gets to, he, he unfolds this revelation of the gospel, and I, here's what I want you to hear from me this afternoon, is there's something we need to reach for in our revelation of the gospel, because the issue with America stepping into a full-blown Jesus movement is not just getting more bold. It's not just getting more courageous. It's actually getting convinced in the reality of the gospel. Because if you thought it was good news, could you possibly hold it back? What if tonight in your bedroom laboratory you discovered the cure to every single kind of cancer on the earth? Would you keep it in your bedroom? Why not? Because you're convinced of the cure. See, this Jesus movement we're all believing for, and it's already beginning to occur in our nation, isn't being held back by a lack of boldness. Are we convinced of the cure? Because when we're convinced, we can't not talk about it. We can't not walk up to the sick. We can't not share with our classmates. We can't not prophesy over our teachers. We can't not share with our friends and our family. Why? Because if you had the cure to cancer, you wouldn't hold it back from a single cancer patient on the earth. Well, the whole world has cancer, and Jesus is the cure. And if we're convinced, if we're convinced in the power of the gospel, then every one of you becomes a bold witness on your campus, your high school, your home, your neighborhood, your friends, and your family. Paul was so convinced of this, he goes, you know what, for me at this point, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I love this statement. He's so convinced of the power of the gospel that he goes, if I'm alive on this earth, it's to move the gospel of the kingdom forward. He goes, but if I die in that pursuit, he goes, that's actually better because I'm so convinced of the gospel and the goodness of Jesus, I'd really like to be face to face with him right now. And can you imagine how much everyone hated a man like that? Because he's just crushing life. He's just leading people to Jesus left and right. He's healing dudes left and right. Everywhere he goes, a church is planted. Kingdom's advancing. So they're like, we hate you, and we're going to kill you. And he's like, please, can it be today? And they're like, dang it, he wants to die. Fine, we're not going to kill you. He goes, you're going to regret it. I'm going to bring so much heaven on earth today that you're going to wish I was dead. And they're like, fine, we're going to kill you. And they go, he, he's like, great, can it be right now? Can we stop talking about it? Can we do it? Because I'd really love to see Jesus right now. And they're like, fine, we're going to throw you in prison. He goes, fine, I'll write letters that will change the whole world for thousands of years. He goes, if you leave me alive then Christ will be advanced in the nations. But if I were to die, then I get what I'm actually living for, which is face-to-face -face relationship. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. This is the goodness and the reality of the gospel. Here we go. I want you to stand up right now. This might be new for you, but this, is, uh, this whole experience is probably new for you because you started last night with Brian Barcelona and Brian Headwelch ripping on electric guitars. So I'm just assuming everything about this Vox conference is new, um, and so we're just going to roll with that new theme. I want you to turn to the person next to you, pair up. If you need to get into a group of three, you can, but no bigger than three. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. 30 seconds, are you ready? And in your 30 seconds, I want you to assume the person in front of you has never heard the gospel before, ever. And you have 30 seconds to proclaim the good news of Jesus. And you're like, what do I share? Share whatever's in your heart. You're like, well, it's, it's such a big message. Just share part of it. Whatever it is, I want you to begin to unleash the reality of the gospel. Are you ready? 30 seconds, go for it. Ten more seconds. Give him ten more seconds.
Five more seconds. All right, amen, good job. If you, were, if you heard the gospel from someone, tell them they did a great job sharing what was on their heart. Cheer them on a little bit. Okay, next person, stay standing. Next person, it's your turn, but you have one assignment. You have to share it more passionately than they did. Whatever passion level they shared with, you must share with more passion. Are you ready? One minute to passionately proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Go for it. Keep going. Give them your heart. Give them your guts. Ten more seconds. Ten more seconds. Ten more. I'm extending your time. All right, amen. Give them a high five. Tell them they were awesome. How many of you just got saved in the room? Yeah, it's a lot of salvations. Yeah, yes, in the front row, I see that hand. All right, grab your seats. I hope, here's, here's my fundamental belief. Are you ready for this? We're getting wild in here now this afternoon. Here's my fundamental belief. Every time you proclaim the good news of Jesus, it is life to your soul. It's the good news. How can it not be? Every time you speak it, it is life to your soul. It is nourishment to your spirit. It is life to your body, the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ. We're going to keep going here, and you're going to probably do this again in a couple minutes. We'll see. I want to talk to you now, we're talking about the greatness of the gospel, just a few minutes. We're not going to go the full time today. The second thing I want to hit you with is the power of the gospel. I am completely convinced that we have propped up a weak version of Jesus today and it must be destroyed. It must be destroyed. I'm still in a good mood, I hope you are. But we have to deal with the issue of powerless Christianity. Because if Jesus walked in the room, power would be released. And the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead and lived inside of him lives in us. And the same Bible is the same truth that has always been for 2,000 years. The same God is on the throne. The same intercessor is at his right hand. The same spirit lives inside of us. The same word is releasing life. Why are we not seeing the power that the book of Acts saw? Do we believe the gospel? Do we believe the power of the gospel? I believe with all my heart, and I'm prophesying now, that this generation will close the gap between the modern day church and the book of Acts church. And I believe with all my heart, this millennial generation, this Gen Z that's in high school right now, that this generation is not content to live in a stream of the body of Christ. That this generation wants it all. And that for far too long we've set up our tents around what we're comfortable with. But I think there's a generation on the earth that wants it all. And when you talk about the word, you're like, oh, God, I want more of the word. And as soon as you talk about the spirit, you're like, oh, Holy Spirit, I want more of your power. And when we talk about holiness, you're like, oh, God, I love holiness. And when we talk about purity, it's like, oh, Lord, purify my heart and purify my eyes. And we talk about the nations, we're like, I'd go tomorrow. But when we talk about our neighbors, we're like, I'll go today. When we talk about the marketplace, we go, there's hope for it. We want to see transformation. I just think there's a generation on the earth that goes, I want it all. I don't want to live in a stream. I don't want to pitch my tent. I want to live in the Jesus River. And I want to see a Jesus movement that doesn't pick the parts of Jesus we're comfortable with, but wants the whole man. Wants the whole man. 
Not the parts of the gospel we're comfortable with, but the whole man. I just think that's who's in the room. I just think you're tired of division. You're tired of disunity, and you've read that thing and go, I want to live the whole thing. Every part of it. The uncomfortable parts. The hard parts that are challenging. I want it all. I want to live the whole witness of the kingdom unveiled in the scriptures. I think that's who's in the room. You look at Jesus and we want, we go, we want his elbow, we want his hands, we want his arms, we want his feet, we want his legs, we want his heart, we want everything about him. We want everything. Mercy to the poor, absolutely. Destruction of injustice, 100%. Proclamation of the gospel, yes, all of it. Saving, healing, delivering, yes, all of it. This is the gospel. The power of the gospel. I've thought about this and have any of you guys ever um, rode those things, what it's called a Segway? Mall cop? Yeah, so raise your hand if you've ridden a Segway. I'm just curious. All of you have more humility than me. I've never been able to humble myself to get on a Segway. And, uh, and then, you know, if, if I came to you this afternoon and I was like, hey, guys, the gift that Brian Barcelona and his massive generosity, I mean, it's just their generosity just over the top. And out of their generosity, everybody in the room, you get to pick one of two vehicles when you leave this afternoon. And I'm like, you can have a brand new 2018 Segway. And you're like, oh, the power. <laughs> or I was like, option B, I don't know, it's a little more cumbersome. You need a parking spot, but you could have a Hummer. And you're like, hmm. How many Christians in the church are rocking their segways around when Jesus died to give every single believer a Hummer? And we're like, why is there more power in this thing? It's electric. Why can't I go any faster? It has two wheels. Why do my friends not want to really talk about this? Because you look interesting on that thing. Why do my, none of my friends seem interested in the gospel? Because you rocked up in a segway. And they were like, who is this guy? And you're like, come join my Segway club. And you too can have a Segway. We've got Segway jackets. They're pleather. Everybody gets one. Segways for Jesus, we call it. Every Saturday morning we ride the town and people tremble in fear. When they hear our electric motors coming down the road. There goes the Segway, Segway gang, look out. Maybe the world has not come running to the church because the church hasn't believed in the power of the gospel that Jesus died to release on the earth. And we can like, we can get all, I mean, you could get new rims on that Segway. You could add an exhaust pipe to it that doesn't even work. You could like put a, like a horn, or, you know, an ornament on the front. You could have the loudest horn. Your Segway's got a boat horn attached to it. But I'm sorry, at the end of the day, it's a Segway. It still goes five miles an hour. And maybe today we've got a whole bunch of like real like, you know, tricked out Segways. And we're wondering why it's not working. Because Jesus didn't die for powerless Christianity. He died to release a power that could change the whole world, that sickness would bow its knee to. He died to release a power that addiction would be shattered with one touch of that power. He died to release a power on the earth that could break every ounce of demonic bondage, every ounce of depression, destroy every bit of anxiety. That's the power of the gospel in our lives. And what will happen to a lost world when they look on to a church that is actually starting to move in power? What will happen? Let me ask you this. Think about this real scenario. Those of you in high school, what would happen in your high school if one of your friend's blind eyes was opened? Because that's what happened in every day of Jesus' life. What would happen in your university or your workplace when that person that everybody knows has that chronic illnesses was healed in an instant? It's called the gospel. It's called the power of God. What would happen if the church was known to walk in that kind of power? The lost would come running to the only one who can truly set them free, Jesus. 
Mark. Let's look at the book of Mark here real quick. Are you liking the gospel power here? You were a little quiet there. I'm still in a good mood. Here we go. Mark chapter 1. I was looking at this, and I'm not going to spend long on this because I think we all believe this, but I want to encourage you that this is the reality of the message that we carry, is that these headings were added to the book of Mark, and I want to read you a few of them because it gives you a snapshot into the Jesus' uh, Jesus's life. And they're, they're not scripture. They weren't in the original you know, letters or manuscripts, but they were added later so we could see the paragraphs or the categories. But they're remarkable when you see the summary statements of a day in the life of Jesus. So let's just read some of those. And when I read them, I actually want you to shout back to me the verb. Now, luckily, some of you guys are still in school because verbs was a long time ago for me. So hopefully you are still in school can help the rest of us with our grammar. But when, when I say something like the line here, Jesus announces the good news, then you guys are going to shout... Announces, we have a lot of grammar pros in here. So here we go. First one, Jesus drives out an impure spirit. Jesus heals many. Jesus prays in a solitary place. Jesus heals a man with leprosy. Jesus forgives a paralyzed man. Jesus heals a paralyzed man. Jesus eats with sinners. Jesus calls Levi. Jesus heals on the Sabbath. Jesus appoints the 12. Jesus is uh, skipping. <laughs> no, he didn't skip. I mean, he might have skipped, but. <laughs> Jesus calms the storm. Jesus restores a demon-possessed man. Jesus raises a dead girl. Heals a sick woman. Jesus sends out the 12. Feeds the 5,000. Walks on water. Heals a Syrophoenician woman, <laughs> feeds the 4,000, heals a deaf man, heals a blind man, heals another blind man. Eight chapters in the book of Mark. This is our Jesus. This is the gospel. This is the reality. This is what he's really like. This is what the kingdom we've been brought into. One of these stories alone, we don't have time to go into all of them, but this one blows my mind. And I'm just going to summarize it. In, in uh, Mark chapter 5, we have this amazing story where Jesus, at the end of chapter 4, he goes through a, a storm in the middle of the night in a boat. You guys remember the story? He packs up his disciples. They're having a great meeting. Everyone's getting touched by the glory. And Jesus goes, you know what? We're moving on. His disciples are like, that's a terrible idea. Terrible idea for a lot of reasons. We got a lot of fame here. We got a breakthrough. We should start a website and start a ministry and take an offering because now is the time to launch the ministry. That's one reason that they're puzzled as to why Jesus would leave. The other reason they're puzzled is because there are massive dark clouds in the distance and they are getting in a boat and they're fishermen. They know what dark clouds mean. They know a storm when they've seen one. And they're getting into a boat to cross the lake in the middle of the night in a raging storm. Halfway through that, you go to the story. The storm's raging and fishermen who are weather pros, they're, they're water experts. They've been in the water their whole lives. This storm's so big that these experts think they're about to die. So then they wake Jesus up. He's sleeping on a cushion in the back of the boat. Jesus they wake him up, and they're like, we're afraid to die. He rebukes the wind and the waves. Power. He rebukes the wind and the waves. They stop in the moment, and the disciples are like, who in the world is this man? And they're afraid of him, it says. Then they finally get where they went all night to go, and they land in a graveyard. If you weren't questioning leaders, Jesus' leadership before, you're definitely questioning it now. What's wrong with this man? Who gets into a boat in the middle of a storm, goes all night long to get to a graveyard? When they get to that graveyard, they have the most interesting welcoming party in the entirety of the New Testament. Man comes up to him, it says, who has been chained to the tombs. He's been out of control. He's been running through the night, cutting himself, not wearing anything. He's so demonically tormented, so demonically possessed that nobody knows how to control him. The community has rejected him, and he's in the tombs, and that's the man that comes to meet Jesus and the disciples when they land on the shore. What would you do if you were a disciple in this moment? I get back in the boat and leave him there. They get out of the boat, man runs up to him. Jesus, in the midst of that, actually begins to have a conversation with him, which probably scares the disciples even further. When he saw Jesus from a distance, the man ran, fell on his knees in front of him, shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God, in God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Very interesting question. 
Disciples are like, why do you even want to know his name? Do you want to have a tea party with him next? What are we going to do here? What's this about? My name is Legion. That's a frightening answer. How many of you know when you ask someone their name and they say, I am a whole bunch of people, that that's a really interesting answer? <laughs> hey, buddy, what's your name? Army. Army of what? Army of demons. Wow. Like a, like a lot? Yes, a legion, actually. A whole battalion. There's a lot of us in here. And, and that's his answer. Like His name's not Billy. It's not Bob. It's not John. It's not something normal. It's, it's legion. It's giant army. And, and Jesus, and they begged Jesus again and again not to send them out there. A large herd of pigs is there. The demons begged Jesus to send us in the pigs. It's a very strange story. Jesus immediately cast them, the demons out of the man. They fill up a herd of pigs of 2,000. That was not lying about legion. 2,000 pigs begin to run off the cliff. They drown. And the man is totally set free. The community comes out to see what's happening because the word spreads. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by a legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, told them about the pigs as well. And the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. This story is remarkable on a number of levels. One, because of Jesus' radical love for the one. His radical pursuit of the hardest heart in the entire New Testament. He goes, cross a lake in a storm? No big deal. Let's do it. It's worth it because there's a man on the other side that nobody believes could be set free. Because they don't know the power of the gospel. Braves the storm, sleeps through it actually. Gets to the other side, has a conversation, and in a moment, a man who had been tormented for years, an outcast in his society, possibly the most bound man in the entire New Testament, in one moment, he is set free and he's sitting there in his right mind. Come on. Come on. And, 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 and at times, we've been afraid of someone who's just like a little bit intimidating. Or we've gone like, I don't know if they really ever even want to hear the gospel. I don't know if they could really change. We've written people off. We thought my parents, I don't know, they're too far, you know, hard-hearted. Or thought of our friends and go, I don't know, they're just, they're so out there. They're so in the world. They've got so much going on. This is a lesson for all of time in the power of the gospel. It has never seen a heart it could not change. It has never seen a situation it could not change. It has never seen a number of demonic powers or bondage or any type of, you know, what's going on here is never never seen anything that could stop the power of the gospel. But do we believe that? Your high school is not too hard. Your university is not too hard. Your neighborhood's not too hard. Jesus looked on at the very nation that was about to kill him and crucify him. And it says they were harassed and helpless without, like sheep without a shepherd. It says they were sick and they were diseased, they were harassed and they were helpless, and we know later on they're actually about to kill him. And he looks on at that nation and he goes, oh, the harvest is ripe. All I need is laborers. The harvest is ripe. He looks at our cities today and he, all he says is the harvest is ripe. I just need people that believe it. He looks at your high school and he says, gosh, the harvest is ripe. The more the manifestation of evil, the more the manifestation of difficulty, the riper the harvest is. The more broken the situation, the riper the harvest. He looks on at our cities. He looks on at our nation. He looks on at the nations of the earth. He looks on at different geographic regions all over the world that have been called too hard, too dark. And he looks to his church and he goes, guys, the harvest is ripe. But does anyone believe me? The harvest is ripe. All I need is a few laborers who actually believe in the power of the gospel that there's nothing I cannot do and there's no one I cannot set free. And today, right now, our high schools, our universities, our neighborhoods across this nation are just waiting for the good news of Jesus Christ. It is powerful. It is so powerful. There's nothing it cannot accomplish. And today, we need to erase all of the impossibilities that we have written around the gospel message. Are you ready to erase those today? Come on, what's the name? What's the name of the person you've thought too hard? Nope, not anymore. Come on, what's the place in your neighborhood you've just been like, no way, not going there. Not anymore, guys. Come on, 
What's the city and the nation that you thought, oh, it's too hard, and we just end up cursing that city and talking about how hard it is? Nope, not anymore. What's the friend, what's the family member right now in your mind that you thought, I don't don't know, I just don't know, I just think maybe they're too far gone. Nope, not anymore. The harvest is ripe. Do you believe it? Do you believe in the greatness and the power of the gospel? Because if we do, we can't not talk about it everywhere we go. And a Jesus movement is not rocket science. What we're believing for, millions of salvations across America, a missions movement to the nations of the earth greater than we've ever seen in history. I'm telling you, it's coming. It's coming and it's already begun. But it's not going to happen on stages, microphones, and a few voices or a few big names or a few conferences. You know how it's going to happen? Every believer starts to believe the gospel. You and I. It's you and I, everyday normal people beginning to believe and love and live and proclaim the gospel everywhere we go. This Jesus movement is an inch away from the church being reminded of the power of the gospel. Because when we're convinced of the cure, we'll take it everywhere. Come on. Are you with me today? All right, I want to end with this story to give you courage and then we're done. You have five more minutes? Then Lindy might lead us in some wild choruses to end here. We're going to end in joy, a ton of joy, because I just think this room is full of leaders, future leaders, who are going to take this good news of Jesus all over the earth. And you know, we live in the generation. We live in the generation. This is fact. This is not prophecy. We live in the generation that will see every single language on earth have the Bible and every single people group on earth hear the gospel. For the first time in 2,000 years, this generation will see every single people group on earth hear the gospel and every single language on earth have the scriptures. For 2,000 years, we've been waiting for this. And it's in our day. We live in the most exciting hour of human history, guys. There's not a boring day in the kingdom. Early 1900s, I'm going to end with this story and then we're going to pray. In the early 1900s in Wales, in uh, the UK, there was a rumbling of a Jesus movement coming. There were intercessors and people that were starting to pray and believe and they were starting to share the faith that God placed in their hearts, but nothing had tipped yet. I, I want to say there's a couple dozen people in the nation that are stirring, not even what we have in this room right now. But they're stirring and God is putting faith in their hearts that something's about to take place in Wales. It's the early 1900s. And so they're starting to pray like never before. They're starting to fast and they're starting to share their confidence in the coming move of God. But it's not tipped. It's not moved into a wildfire. It's not moved into a real Jesus movement. And it's not moved into what they felt God had promised. And there's one day, one day, And a little town that I went to a number of years ago called New Quay on the north shore of Wales. And I went there and I was looking in this little church, old church, you could tell, it was like so old. And I'm looking in the window, you can't get in there, it's locked. And then this lady walked up who must have been like 350 years old. She was awesome. And and she was like one of those amazing Welsh ladies who was like, my mom babysat the revivalists and, you know, I have the original piano that was played. It was all these crazy stories. But she says this, she says, do you want me to tell you what happened in here that started the Welsh revival? I go, of course I want you to. She unlocks it, takes me in this room, just this boring little room. Just small, square, nasty carpet. She goes, let me tell you what happened in this room. She tells me about the stirring across the nation. She said this whole thing started in a youth group. I'm like, oh, tell me more. She goes, it was one night, there was a man, one of those 12, he was preaching and he was undone by the promise of God for coming revival for his nation. He was undone, he'd had it, he'd crossed a line, he was moved into desperation, he'd moved into faith. And he was preaching the message of the simple gospel. And he was talking to those youth group students, and they were high schoolers, 14, 15, 16. And he he was giving his heart, he was sweating through his shirt, he was giving everything in him. Do you believe the gospel? Are you willing to give your life for Jesus? And he gets so frustrated, maybe you've been there at some point in your life, that he basically just stops and he goes, I do any of you believe this good news of Jesus? This is a Christian youth group, but the church is, is struggling across the nation, and he just waits, awkward silence, totally awkward. She's telling me this story. 
She goes, then the shyest kid in the whole youth group, 16 years old, her name was Flory Evans, says she stands up, all of her other friends, maybe 20 in the room, so quiet, so shy, and this is all she says. She goes, I love the Lord Jesus with all my heart. And the testimony was that it was like electricity hit the room and every other kid in the room fell on their faces and they began to repent of their sin and they began to cry out for the mercies of God. And for hours, the Spirit of God moved through that youth group, fully awakening them until they said that they were soundly born again. That testimony of Flory Evans, this little 16-year-old, began to travel around the nation and the other 12 or 20 in the nation that had faith for a move of God decided and they declared and they began to preach like never before. Now is the time for an awakening in Wales. And do you know that six months from the day that Flory Evans made that declaration, 100,000 people were saved in Wales. 100,000. And that young girl catalyzed a move of God by simply believing and responding to the gospel and declaring it in front of her friends without sophistication, without complexity, without the 10 points, without an outline sermon. All she said in essence was, it's true. I believe. It's the gospel. And the result was a hundred thousand salvations across the nation and it was the Welsh revival that sparked the Azusa Street revival right down the road that literally touched every single nation on earth because of one young girl my conviction is is that this room is full of young girls and young guys who believe the gospel and what would happen if you believed it so much its greatness and its power that you just began to proclaim it everywhere you went. And you believed that you had the cure. What would happen in your high schools, your neighborhoods, your families? I want to tell you, you are the catalytic spark. You are the catalytic spark. It's not going to be the 30-year-olds. It's not going to be the 40-year-olds. It's not going to be the 50-year-olds. It's not going to be the 60-year-olds. It's going to be the teenagers. It's going to be the 20-year-olds. It's going to be you guys. So why don't you stand with me? Here's where we're going to end by declaring, and Lindy, if you have anything, you feel free to come up and sing it, because it is fun to end in song. But we are going to, we're going to rip through the roof here, declaring something together. Are you guys down with that? And here's what we're doing as we declare this, is, is we are, we're going to call down every bit of intimidation, fear, shame related to the gospel message, so that you don't go through your high school years never having shared the good news of Jesus Christ. We're going to call down every hindrance. We're going to break everything that would hold our mouths back from proclaiming, our hands back from healing, our voices back from speaking, our, our hearts back from loving. We're going to break through every hindrance that would hold back the gospel message from our lips because we're actually convinced of it. And we're going to do it by declaring what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel. <laughs> Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Can we declare that together today? Not yet. Because when we declare this thing, we're, we're going to rip through the roof on this. Why? Because we've got to walk out of this room free of intimidation. We've got to walk out of this room free of hesitation. We've got to walk out of this room a little more convinced than we came in that this is the power to change, the power to save, and the power to transform. Our nation is waiting for the gospel. Our high school are waiting for the gospel. The nations of the earth are waiting for the gospel. Your classmates are waiting for the gospel. So on three, we're going to declare with everything in us, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And when you're done shouting, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, just keep on shouting. Let's just lift the lid on this place till we know we have dealt with what holds us back from proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Are you in? On three, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Are you ready to shout louder than you've ever shouted in your life? Okay, here we go. One, two, three.
Hey guys, this is so fun. I just feel like, raise your hand if you just feel the electricity of the gospel right now. Yeah, come on. So sometimes it's so fun to just do something unconventional and sing a phrase that captures the moment because it unifies us. It's, that happens throughout the Bible all the time. So when Andy was just praying that, I just kept hearing this phrase going, the power to save, the power to change, this is the gospel alive in me. So I'm not ashamed, I'm not ashamed, Jesus I love you with all of me. The power to save, the power to change, this is the gospel alive in me. So I'm not ashamed, I'm not ashamed, Jesus I love you with everything. Okay, you think you got it? So we're going to sing the power to save, the power to change. This is the gospel alive in me. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. Jesus, I love you with everything. Does that sound good? All right, here we go. It's the power to change, the power to save. This is the gospel alive in me. So I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed, Jesus, I love you with everything. The power to save, the power to change. This is the gospel alive in me. So I'm not ashamed, I'm not ashamed, Jesus, I love you. With that, one more time, sing it out. It's the power to save, the power to change. This is the gospel alive in me. So I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. Jesus, I love you with everything. The power to say, the power to change. This is. So I'm not ashamed, I'm not ashamed, Jesus I love you, sing I'm not ashamed, so I'm not ashamed, yeah. I'm not ashamed, yeah. Jesus I love you, oh let's shout it out, we sing I'm not ashamed, I'm not ashamed, Jesus I love you, one more time sing I'm not, and I'm Yes, God, just let this song just mark our generation. God, let it mark the generation in this room that we love you, Lord, with all of our hearts, all of our souls. God, we just say we are not ashamed of the gospel in Jesus' name. Yeah, just, just one more time sing, I'm not ashamed. And I'm not ashamed. And Jesus, I love you with everything. Oh, I'm not ashamed. Yeah, I'm not ashamed. Jesus, I love you with everything. We could literally sing it for the rest of the afternoon, I feel like. So God, just brand this on our hearts. Brand it on our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.